This is a tweet from September 2016. The world's changed a lot in the last five years, but what hasn't changed is the frequency which I've thought about that tweet from Google's Senior Vice President of Platforms and Ecosystems, Hiroshi Lockheimer. Now on the surface of that tweet, it was pretty obvious that he was talking about the Made by Google program, this new umbrella program that would encompass products like the Google Pixel, the Google Home, Google Nest, Nest Hub, Pixel Buds, maybe in the future a Pixel Watch, basically hardware that was made by Google itself. Now, yeah, Google had worked with hardware before. It made Nexus devices, these phones and tablets, these developer devices that were used to test the latest and greatest features on Android. And it sold them to developers as well as geeks and nerds like you and me. But it didn't actually make the hardware for those Nexus devices. It just made the software that ran on top of them. Samsung Galaxy Nexus, LG Nexus 4, Huawei Nexus 6P, Asus Nexus 7. I mean, yeah, Google had some influence in the design, but the whole process was just so fragmented. Those other guys made the hardware. Qualcomm made the SoC that actually ran the thing. Google just did what it does best. It made the software. It made Android. So when Google announced that it was making its own phone, the Google Pixel series, everyone got excited. And yeah, there's a lot of benefit to having a more fragmented series of devices. Android being open source is a great thing. It allows all these different manufacturers and ODMs to make their own phones. And more phones means more choice, and that's generally great for the consumer. But no one single Android phone could really hold up to the cohesiveness that customers were getting with the iPhone. So there was a lot of hype that maybe this Google Pixel phone could be the Android iPhone that everybody was waiting for. But here's the thing, when the Google Pixel launched, the only thing that really changed was the branding. Now instead of LG or Huawei or Motorola, it said Google on the back of the phone. But was it really a phone made by Google? What makes an iPhone an Apple phone is not the logo on the back of the device. It's the fact that Apple makes the software, the hardware, and the silicon, the SOC that binds those two things together. It is literally architecting features directly in hardware for what it wants its iPhone to be able to do. And I mean, credit to Google. If there's one company that has figured out how to get around hardware restrictions with software, it's them. But designing your SOC just gives you so much control over your device. And yeah, it did take a lot of pressure off of Google to allow Qualcomm to make the SOC for their phones. I mean, Android is in billions of phones. They should probably be focusing on that. But without making their own SOC, they were really leaving a lot of capability on the table. So in a way, that idea that the Pixel was the iPhone of Android was kind of a false narrative. Google was still really constrained by what Qualcomm wanted out of its SOCs. And don't get me wrong, Qualcomm has made some incredible SOCs. They're super fast, have amazing processing. They are great chips. But it's pretty clear to me that Google and Qualcomm are not exactly in alignment out of what they want out of a smartphone. The Google Pixel series was always about something completely different. But that was then, and this is today, September 2021. And Google's already gone ahead and announced its next generation Pixel devices, the Pixel 6 and the Pixel 6 Pro. But alongside those phones, it also announced something a lot more critical to its master plan, an in-house processor named Tensor. And today, five years on, I'm convinced that Hiroshi tweet wasn't about the made by Google program or the Pixel or the Pixel Buds or maybe a Pixel Watch in the future. It's about something a lot more fundamental, a total shift in the way that we use technology going forward. And it all started with a little assistant that was embedded on almost every device that Google announced on October 4th, 2016. Okay, let's reel it back a bit. Let's talk about how we use technology right now. Just to extract the information or actions that you want out of your technology can require a lot of inputs and a lot of senses that require your attention. Just using your smartphone can require touch, sight, hearing, and speaking, all of these things that take you away from the world around you. And the friction between us and the technology that we use is dictated by the amount of inputs and the time to output that it takes for that device to give us the information or action that we want. So then, to advance technology, we should probably be trying to reduce the number of inputs that we need to put into a device to get the information or value from that system. 
Let's use something really basic as an example. Say you're in a coffee shop and you're trying to figure out what song is playing on the radio. Right now, you gotta pick up your phone, you gotta unlock your phone, you gotta open the browser, you gotta type in the lyrics of the song that you heard with your ears, you gotta hit search, you gotta look at the result, you gotta lock your phone. That's a lot of steps. It takes a lot of time, and it fundamentally removes your attention from what you were doing before you started using that device. This is a whole process that can be almost completely removed with something called ambient computing. Computers processing information around you with as little input as possible. And in 2017, Google used ambient computing to reduce the amount of inputs to get that song at the coffee shop to almost zero. Google called this feature Now Playing. Pixel phones could record little snippets of audio data when it noticed that music was playing around you and use machine learning to compare that against a local database to display the song that was playing on your phone. What previously required all those inputs and your attention being taken away from what you were doing previously now just requires a glance. It is computing ambiently. It is giving you the information before you even asked for it. That feature is part of the Google Assistant, the virtual assistant that launched on top of almost every product that Google announced on October 4th, 2016. And ever since then, Google's been trying to get the assistant to reduce the friction between you and your technology even more, mostly by using machine learning. Now in 2021, the Google Assistant can screen calls that you're not sure you wanna pick up. It can scrape your email and send you reminders so you can get to your flight on time. And it can even make you reservations at a restaurant so that you don't have to talk to a real human. Now, obviously the most ideal way to interact with a Google Assistant would be to not interact with it at all. Everything that it does would be ambient. You wouldn't have to ask and it would compute it for you. But generally, even the most basic systems require at least one input in order to get an output. And Google is pretty convinced that the most frictionless way to insert information into a system is through speech. Just speak something out into the world, it gets computed, and the result comes back to you. Not true ambient computing, but as close as you could feasibly get. But here's the thing, if Google wants us to live in this world, it needs the Google Assistant to be everywhere. You shouldn't have to run to the other room to grab your phone so that you can say the hot phrase into your phone and then it can perform the action for you. You should be able to be out for a drive or out for a run or in your bedroom. The Google Assistant needs to be everywhere. And over the last five years, Google's actually done a pretty good job at that. Since 2016, Google's managed to put the Assistant in pretty much almost every type of the device you can think of. It's in phones, it's in speakers, it's in watches, it's in headphones and earphones. And Google's tailored the Assistant to feel invisible, to blend in. Almost all of the products it makes use a mixture of fabric and soft, neutral materials. The Google Home literally looks like an air freshener. Heck, I ask my Wi-Fi router every single morning what the weather is. I think Google's plan is working, and I get it. You're probably wondering why. Why is Google working so hard to get the Google Assistant in every single corner of your life and make your life easier? And as it always comes back to, the answer is probably advertising. Google, as it turns out, is an ads business. As much as it might seem like they only make Search or YouTube or Gmail, the thing that makes them most of their money is advertising. I mean, the internet literally could not be free without the advertising dollars paying for it. You are paying with your eyeballs, and now, more recently, you're paying with your information. But advertising really does run the web, and almost every single product that Google makes has a hook that brings you back to serve you an ad. And that might seem a little counterintuitive, right? If Google makes most of its money on advertising, why would it be trying to ambiently compute you as much information as it can and just show you that song on your phone instead of making you do the search and see the ad to get the result? Well, maybe you're right. Maybe it's not monetizing everything just yet, but Google can't just sit back and watch the world change around it. If Google is gonna keep monetizing our use of technology, it has to be one of the players that dictates how we use technology in the future. It knows that in some distant future, no matter how far away that is, we're gonna be using technology in a much more frictionless, seamless way with information being ambiently computed and then fed to us. And maybe, just maybe, worst case scenario, we'll have to put in an input in order to get the output we want. And Google has been trying to dictate how we use technology in the future for a long time. In 2013, it introduced Google Glass, this wearable display that would kind of passively ambiently show you the information you needed in your peripherals so you could still do what you were going to do 
on a daily basis. It would show you notifications and where you should turn on Google Maps, but unfortunately, Google Glass kind of died before it got started. People were getting pulled over on the highway because the highway patrolman didn't know if they were watching a movie in their glass, and people were getting kicked out of movie theaters because the theater didn't know if the tenants were recording the movie through their glass. It had a lot of security flaws that people didn't really take into account, and ultimately, it died. But luckily, the legacy of what it represented did not. Ever since then, there have been all these different wearables that have popped up from smartwatches to fitness trackers, and the Google Assistant is pretty much a byproduct of that ambient computing future. And let's be clear, Google was not the first one to come up with a voice assistant. Voice assistants have been around for a very long time. I mean, even Amazon Alexa and Siri came out way before the Google Assistant. But I think that Google is probably the most well-positioned company on the planet to take advantage of a voice assistant. And that's because of two things. One, the freakishly large amount of data that it collects, and two, it's insane machine learning models. Machine learning is really the foundation of the natural language processing that really powers the Google Assistant. And over the last five years, Google has been working freakishly hard to make sure that these natural language processing models are as efficient as possible. The reality is just as important as the sheer number of Google Assistant beacons that you have around you at all times is the speed and accuracy at which the Google Assistant can compute your operations or tasks. If you have a thousand Google Assistants floating around you all the time, but none of them can understand what you're saying and can't do that operation quickly, you're not going to use it. And the way the Google Assistant used to work, yeah, it was a little frustrating. You'd say the hot word out into the world and say your query, but then the Google Assistant would recognize that you said the hot word, would send your little snippet of voice data up into the cloud, would actually compute that on the natural language processing models it had on its servers, then it would perform the action and send it back to you. It just made it take way too long. Remember, zero friction. That's the goal. So at Google I.O. in 2019, Google made a huge jump when it used machine learning to reduce the AI model of the Google Assistant from about 100 gigabytes to just half a gig. So now it can be stored directly on your phone. So now you make an input into your device, it processes what you're saying on your phone, and then it makes the action. It only really needs to connect to the internet if it needs to pull information from the internet. But local things could be handled locally on your device. But even with Google moving the Assistant onto the device, it just wasn't enough. The reality is people don't like feeling like they're interacting with the robots. And to get rid of that feeling, Google had to make it so talking to the Assistant and interacting with that Assistant was as human-like and speedy as physically possible. Google's been trying to make the Assistant more human-like for a long time, and it even got into a lot of controversy with some AI ethicists when it used this new feature called Google Duplex to make appointments for you at places like hair salons, and the person on the other side of the call didn't realize it was talking to an AI. But again, if you are going to be using the Google Assistant on a daily basis, it has to feel that way. It has to feel like you're actually interacting with a human in a very seamless way. And that brings us to last month, when Google kind of randomly announced Google Tensor, the new SoC that would be powering the Google Pixel 6 and the Pixel 6 Pro, would cut out Qualcomm as the middleman, and would allow Google to kind of finally achieve that vertical integration that we've been wanting for years. And while there are a lot of benefits from Google making its own SoC, from being able to support the Pixel for full Android version updates for as many years as it wants, or maybe making its phone a little bit cheaper, I'm convinced that Tensor is much more focused on Google achieving its ambient computing dreams by kind of putting a hold on focusing so much on raw CPU and GPU performance and shifting that yearly update focus towards machine learning cores and ML performance. Google hasn't shared the full details of Tensor with us just yet, but it has sort of revealed that it's going to be basing the chip around the TPU or Tensor processing unit on the device. Those are the cores that really handle the machine learning and deep learning and neural processing tasks. Now this isn't exactly new. Qualcomm has an NPU or neural processing unit on its chips, and Apple uses a neural engine on its chips, and they all basically do the same thing. But while Qualcomm and Apple might be trying to kind of lift overall performance across the board, the GPU and the CPU and the NPU performance across the board, and the Snapdragon 888 is leagues better than the Snapdragon 865 was last year, I'm convinced that Google is focusing directly on the TPU here and kind of saying, well, the CPU and GPU have gotten good enough. 
I don't think that you could really differentiate between a flagship phone from this year and last year. So really, we should be focusing the yearly advancements on the things that are actually making a difference right now. Google has been using machine learning for years to make its software feel like literal magic. I mean, it literally created TensorFlow, the default state-of-the-art machine learning model that everyone is using for their ML tasks. It cheated physics when it allowed you to do astrophotography on your phone. You could do portrait mode with a single lens. You can interpolate pixels by zooming in on a lower resolution camera to make it feel like you've got a higher resolution camera. There's very little that can't be done with machine learning. And even though a big pull of Tensor is going to be to improve Google's natural language processing models and make the Google Assistant faster and more accurate, Tensor should really improve the overall future smartphone experience across the board. And the great thing is there's really nothing stopping Google from making modified versions of Tensors for other form factors and devices. I mean, Apple's been doing this for a few years at this point. The M1 chip that powers Apple's new MacBooks is really just a modified version of its smartphone processor, and so is the chip that powers its watches. Google could feasibly put modified versions of Tensors in Chromebooks and in smart displays and in watches and headphones. And by doing that, it's really repopulating the world with these faster Tensor-enabled Google Assistant beacons that helps it achieve this ambient computing feature where Google Assistant is all around you. So right now, as I drop this video, it's been almost exactly five years, not eight years since Hiroshi dropped that tweet. And who knows, we'll have to see. Tensor could be a complete and total fluke. None of this could work. Nothing could work together. Google has a history of doing that. But I'm very confident that no matter what happens, Google is going to continue to try to get ahead of how we use technology in the future so that it can dictate how we can use that technology. Anyways, guys, that's been about it. I'm gonna keep making videos when I have ideas in my head that I want to share with you, they could be tech, they could be about photography. Who knows? That's the great thing about this channel, right? But uh, regardless, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one. See ya.